Hello, everyone. I hope everybody out there is safe and healthy. I am Howard Dorman, and I first want to thank Change and their executive director, Dr. Sarah E. Brown, and her great staff for giving me the opportunity to share with you my family's story. It is a story of heartbreak, resilience, a lot of luck, and love of the family. And I want to emphasize the love part of it. I am a second generation immigrant. As defined by Wikipedia, today's standard, second generation immigrants in the United States are individuals born and raised in the United States who have at least one foreign born parent. Both of my parents, Ellen and Victor Dorman, were born and raised in Poland. My mom was 19 and my dad was 23 when they came to America in 1946, a year after World War II ended. They both are Holocaust survivors. Before I start the story, I think it's important to share with you why I'm sharing the story of my mom and dad with you. Why tell their story, you might ask. Other people in the world have suffered over time and who is to tell their story? This is my choice. Every day we live, we have choices to make, right? For example, what am I gonna have for breakfast? Or more importantly, how am I going to live my day? How do I make the choices in that day? And make sure that the choices that I make benefit me and benefit others around me. If I don't tell their story, who will? Were they special people? Yes, of course, they're my mom and dad. But their story is not only about them, but it's about those who survived and the millions who were murdered and there is no one to tell their story, no one. Some of those who survived cannot tell their story because they just can't remember, they can't get the hands around the horrors that they faced. And they're those families that have vanished in thin air, nothing. I read somewhere in life, we die twice. Once physically, when we die and are buried in the ground, and the second time when we are forgotten and our name is not remembered anymore. If anything, the message here is not about poor me, poor us, I lost my family, I saw horrible things. This only serves as a foundation of who we have become. My mom made her choice early on that this cannot happen again. And maybe if I speak to the children, to the students, to the educators, to the parents, to the adults, we can change our behavior, and make sure this never happens again. I know it's a tall order as our world sees a lots of tragedies every day, but we keep trying to make it a better place. All my mom wanted to do when she spoke about her experiences was to change one person at a time. I can say she had a profound effect on many people. And I'm not saying that because I'm her son. I've learned from the best, and it's incumbent on us to talk about it and share. Again, if not us, if not me, who then will tell their story? My mom spoke regularly, starting in 1957, when we lived in Kansas, and she continued to speak up until the year before she died in 2014. She loved speaking to the children. She wanted them to understand that we all are different, but we have to find a way to get along. She has always been about this cannot happen again. So the story begins. My mom, Ellen, and dad, Victor, both grew up in Tarnow, Poland. Tarnow is located about 30 miles from Krakow, Poland. Tarnow is a beautiful old city. Both families have been in Tarnow for several generations. 
when the war broke out in 1939, Tarnit had around 50,000 people, which included 25,000 Jews. So it had a very vibrant Jewish heritage going back as far as the 1500s. The Jewish population, by the time 1943 came around, as the ghetto was receiving Jews from all over the area, from smaller towns and villages, swelled to almost 45,000 people. Ghetto, I used that word. A ghetto can be defined as a place where groups of people are kept forcibly segregated from others. The Nazis used ghettos to, dedic to isolate and contain the Jewish population as well as others of occupied Europe. My mom was an only child. She was 12 and a half when the war started in September of 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. Her parents, my grandparents, were Pincus and Chaya Wiener. So this is a picture of my family. On the left, you'll see my grandmother on, on the left. And my grandfather, Pinchas, is carrying my mother on her shoulders. My mother, I think, was two years old in that picture. And all the way to the right is my Uncle Shulam. Uncle Shulam was married. That was his wife. Uncle Shulam had a young family of four children before the war started. Uncle Shulam survived the war, moved to Israel. But be during the war, he lost his wife and his four children but he started over again and raised a beautiful family. On a side note, Uncle Shulam worked for Oscar Schindler and he was, my, my Uncle Shulam was a pallbearer at Schindler's funeral uh, several years ago. On the right, again, is the picture of my grandparents, my grandfather to the left and two over is my grandmother. And those are my great grandparents sitting in front of them, my great grandfather with his hat on. And there's my mom sitting in a rocking chair to the bottom left. This was 1935, so my mom was nine years old. My grandmother, Chaya, as pictured, was one of four children. And around 1900, my great grandfather Mordechai, the one in this picture, decided he wanted to buy more farmland in Poland. So he left his wife and his four children and came to America to work and returned after World War I in 1918 with his earnings and bought more land. Boy, it would have been nice if he bought land on Fifth Avenue or somewhere out in Jersey, right? Bought land in Poland. Two of his children, my mom's uncles, came to the US in the 1930s. My mom's uncle Nathan eventually sponsored my mom and dad when they came here in 1946. My grandmother Chaya had light hair and blue eyes and was able to obtain Christian papers during the occupation. And she was able to live outside of the ghetto. So she took on the persona of a non-Jewish Polish woman. Could you imagine in your life things that you would have to do in order to save your family and save your own life? She used to bring food to my mom and my grandfather when she could until that one day that she was caught and she was murdered in the streets. My mother always blamed herself for her mother's fate. We all carry guilt in so many different ways and we have to deal with it. My grandfather and mother were inseparable until 1943 when the ghetto was finally liquidated and my mom was sent to the Plashov work camp, which was in Krakow. And if you remember from Schindler's List, using that as an identifying movie, that all took place in the Plashov work camp. My grandfather didn't go to Plashov. He was sent to several camps and eventually died in concentration camp Flossenburg. My dad's parents, P 
picture here in two pictures. The one on the left is 1926. My dad was three years old. And the one to the right is 1928, kind of the same pose. Uh, my grandparents were Sasha and Pesla, Dorman. My dad had an older sister, Sarah, and a younger brother, Theodore. On the picture uh, on the right, the older one, there's a cousin in that picture as well. You can see my father is uh, the one all the way to the left on the uh, picture in 1928, and he's smack in the middle on the other one. In, the, in 1939, when the war started, my dad was only 17 years old. I should note that my father was the only one from his family to leave Tarnov alive in 1943. Both of my parents' memories of the ghetto and what was happening inside was just horrible nightmares and memories. Always chaos, loud noises, house to house searches all the time, dogs barking loud all day, all night and the sons of, sounds of gunshots all day, all night. People were herded like cattle to live in the very cramped quarters with very little to eat. They were called out to stand in the town square, morning, nights, during the cold winters, during the hot summers. Two months after the occupation started in 1939, all the Jews were forced to wear a, a white armband with the Star of David on it. About two years later in 1941, all the Jews had to wear a Star of David that was sewn on the left side of all their outer garments. My mother remembered that all the synagogues were burned down within the first year of the occupation. You can imagine with 25,000 Jews, how many synagogues were in the town. If you did work during the occupation, like my mom and dad did, as well as my grandfathers, they were able to provide some food for the family and friends. Most of the work was outside the ghetto, but at least they were able to provide some food, again, to friends and family. No school. Jews were forbidden to attend. There was some private tutoring going on. So if you look at your life now, talking about right now, 2021, how over the past 13 months, we've never experienced this way of life under quarantine. You can't go to school. You're limited with who you can be or who you can see. Please keep in mind, as difficult as this has been, for all of us, things can always be worse. Believe me, in Poland and around Europe, 1939 to 1945, as well as any era of any world wars or takeovers, it can always be worse. Starting in 1942, which was pretty much when the ghetto in Tarnow reached its max, the first action took place. 4,000 people were shot and killed in their homes and streets, and another were eight another 8,000 were transported to the Belzic concentration camp and killed immediately. My grandparents, Sasha and Pesla Dorman, were murdered during this action. The section, second action was in September of 1942, and a final action in June of 1943, which was called Action Jew Free. Can you imagine they gave a name to it? During the last action, almost 12,000 were deported to Belzic again and killed immediately, and thousands were murdered in the streets. My mom and dad always remembered looking out the windows and seeing a river of blood that flowed through the city during these actions. My uncle Theodore and Aunt Sarah, my father's younger brother and older sister, were murdered in the streets of Tarnov during these 
actions. About 4,000 Jews, Jews remained and they were all eventually transferred to Plashev and other camps at the end of 1943. The Germans declared Tarnov at that point to be free from Jews. My mom remained in Plashev until August 6, 1944. During her time there, she trained herself to be a seamstress and tried to work as much as she could to stay alive. During that time, she became very sick. And if she wasn't there with her childhood friend, Franya from Tarnov, they both probably would not have survived if they did not have each other. Everybody needed a support system. During her, one of her sicknesses, she had her appendix taken out. Could you imagine? A young Jewish doctor performed the surgery. Could you imagine just the surgery itself and the complications that come out during in a clean hospital, let alone in an infirmary in the middle of a war camp? Incredible that she lived throughout all of this because normally if you were sick, you were either shot and killed in the infirmary were brought up on the hill in Plashev. When she was in the infirmary, she was in there for several days recuperating. Every day the nurses or the doctors would move her from room to room or bed to bed and change the name on the bed. So it didn't look like it was the same person all the time. Somebody was watching out for her. I said in the beginning, a little luck will get you through. Mom was then transferred from Plashev to Auschwitz-Birkenau in June 1944 with her friend Franja. Their tattoo numbers are one in succession as they both went into the camp together. Franja's number is A22350 and my mom was A22351. Birkenau was a death camp. For the several years that it was active, nearly 3 million people died in the camp through mass murder and starvation and sickness. When Auschwitz-Birkenau was being liberated by the Russians in 1945, she was again transferred out. She went on one of the famous death marches with thousands of other prisoners. She both walked and was transported by train. When I say train, by cattle car, not by a commuter train. They walked or rode on the train from Poland to Germany, and it was a total of 500 miles during the months of January to March. So you can imagine what the conditions were like during the cold of winter. During that death march, she did stop to get with the other prisoners in several other concentration camps, including concentration camp Flossenburg for a brief moment. And that is where her father was. She did not know he was there at the time. The one thing that she said that saved her life was her boots. Yep, her boots. Early on during the ghetto, her father gave her a, set, a pair of custom made boots and said to her, make sure you keep these boots. Do not trade them away. They will help you one day. Well, they helped her on that death march. Eventually she ended up in Bergen-Belsen in Germany, which was a work camp and was liberated from there on April 15th, 1945 by the British. Please note, and Frank died in Bergen-Belsen. When Bergen-Belsen was liberated, the remaining soldiers, the German soldiers in the camp told the prisoners, go eat in the warehouse. We're gonna open up the warehouse. You can go in and you can eat the food. But what they did was they poisoned the bread. And over the next few days, 1500 prisoners died alone for the poisoning of that bread. My mom, my mom had typhoid 
and her mouth was full of sores inside and out. She couldn't eat. Stroke of luck, right? Again, you had to be lucky. When the British liberated the camp, they provided the survivors or the prisoners a care package that included some food and a blouse. This was the first garment, the first blouse that my mom put on since very early on during the war as she was able to get rid of her prison striped garb. My father, after he was transferred out of Plashov in 1944, did travel to a few concentration camps. He had his support also with his friend, Jack Bernhock, who survived as well. And Jack was my godfather. Now, just, just a, a note, you hear I am saying these names to remember. And I mentioned in the beginning that, that it's important we remember the names. Dad spent most of his time in the concentration camp Madhausen, which was a war camp, and was eventually liberated by the Americans from Camp Ebensee, which is one of the subcamps of Madhausen. On a side note, about 26 years ago, my father attended an event here in New Jersey where he and other several survivors of Ebensee had a chance to meet with Colonel Timothy Brennan, who lived not far from them in New Jersey. He was the colonel in charge of the troops that liberated the camp. At that event, Colonel Brennan provided a copy of a letter to the survivors of a letter that he sent home to his wife, Vera, and son, Timmy, when he and the troops entered into the camp. And he was describing what he and his fellow soldiers came upon when they entered the camp. He said in the letter, quote, how can one human being do this to another? I had a chance two years ago to meet his son, Timmy. I only know him by Timmy, not Timothy from the letter. Timmy wrote a book based on his father's experiences during the war. For me, it was a very emotional hug and shows you the circle of life. This is a picture of the first page of the letter that Colonel Brennan wrote to his wife, Vera and Timmy. And you can see that, and that's Timmy, T-I-M-M-I-E. The letter was written on May 16th, 1945. So, mom's liberated, dad's liberated. The war is over. What's next? Where to go? Who's alive? In this picture, my mom was close to 19 years old, my father was close to 23 years old. So you can see my mother already is situated in her apartment and she's wearing the blouse that was in that care package that the British gave her when they liberated Bergen-Belsen. Mom looks pretty good. Look into her eyes, that'll tell it all. My father, this picture was taken a little before liberation. It's hard to see with the crescent, but it says Ebenzi. You can see the Z on it. Uh, it's, it's not the look of a 23 year old. It's the look of a man who probably weighed 70 to 80 pounds, death in his eyes. And I think this was the persona of my dad, of who he was living his life. So my mom was 18 and a half when she was liberated. My mom's thoughts on liberation, nobody is alive. We only had one thing and that was we lived through the war. What is going to happen after that? Who cares? We're going to be liberated and then we were liberated and then you are alive for nothing. You have no education. You have no background. You have no way of making a living for yourself as you are a pauper spiritually, mentally, and physically. 
Nobody you know is alive. After the war, mom was diagnosed with a heart issue and she ended up living in Bad Nauheim, Germany, which is right outside of Frankfurt, about an hour outside of Frankfurt. It was a town that was known for its mineral, mineral springs and it was to help heal her. Matter of fact, General Patton and his troops after the war settled in Bad Nauheim and General Patton loved the city so much, he bought a home there, which I believe was converted into a museum and it's still there. My father, when he was liberated, decided to go back to Tarnov. Maybe he'll find family, maybe he'll find friends. And he and several friends went from Austria and found their way back to Tarnov. What he found was he was not welcomed there at all. Not at all. It took him five minutes, went through, left with his friends and he found his way back to Germany. So one day in 1945 in September, my mother was visiting the Zalheim displaced persons camp with friends which was in the American zone in Frankfurt. And she recognized the young man across the way in the mess hall. She knew this young man from Tarnov, a familiar face. This boy had a younger brother, Theodore, that she went, sorry, that she went to school with. In addition, during the ghetto, this boy's family lived downstairs from my mom and my grandfather. She would say that she had a teen crush on him, but her father, my grandfather, wanted nothing to do with, wanted her to have nothing to do with this boy, even in the ghetto. So she wandered over to him in the mess hall, stood behind him, took her hands to cover his eyes. And what did she say? Guess who? Well, I guess it worked. From that day, they were never separated. They were married March 10th, 1946. And here's pictures of their wedding. So you, you'll notice in the top that who attended the wedding were American soldiers. And in the front row were several Jewish soldiers wearing the talus. And then you can see outside, they arranged a picture with all the soldiers that attending the service. To the right is my mom and dad, and one of the soldiers who gave my mom away. Remarkable. And these were the soldiers that were, were part of General Patton's troops. So they were married for 64 years until my dad died in 2010. They have two wonderful sons, my brother Stephen and me, of course, two loving and adoring daughter-in-laws, Jerry and Pam, five grandchildren, plus their spouses. And now we have not, they had nine great grandchildren. My father did get a chance to meet his first great grandchild, Jacob, before he died. My mom was able to meet four of her grandchildren before she died. So from the two of them, now there are 23 of us. They came to the US on June 18, 1946 through the Manhattan Harbor, which coincidentally and not by design is the same date of my wedding to my wife, Pam, June 18th. They settled in Brooklyn. And as I mentioned, they were sponsored by my mom's uncle, Nathan, who I mentioned earlier came to the US in the 1930s. So you might ask, how was their transition, their early transition, a year after liberation into America on American soil? In the beginning, they never spoke about the war. 
one day in June, 1946, my mom was in the open air market in Brooklyn, wearing a short sleeve blouse. And a Jewish man looks at her and says, oh, I see you have a number. So you came from Germany? Were you in a camp? Were you one of the ones that were so good to the Germans that you lived? Can you imagine that? From then on, for a long time, she hid her number by wearing long sleeves. They both cried constantly. My father was afraid to walk in the street sometimes because he forgot his armband. Every time a policeman came by, they would get the shivers because these were little things that always they can count on in the ghetto. And they always came back to haunt them. It was always painful to remember. So the transition wasn't easy. But time, time wore on. From Brooklyn, they moved to Connecticut where I was born. Then they had a quick stop in New Jersey, but then they moved to Kansas from 1956 to 1961 and then back to New Jersey. Here's a picture of my backyard of my parents' home in Fairlawn, New Jersey. My, my father loved the backyard. You can see how proud he was. Uh, this is probably 1967. I was 13 years old. I'm the good looking one on the bottom there. Uh, but you can see how happy my brother Stephen in the middle. My dad suffered from night terrors for a long time. If you go back to the picture, you could understand it. He did suffer from PTSD, I guess. It's like anybody else who witnessed what he witnessed, just like others who have prisoners of war, soldiers. You know, for them not to talk about it was very similar to the soldiers from World War II who did not talk about what they saw, the horrors that they saw. But as he got older, he did get better was able to talk more about his experiences and eventually was interviewed by Steven Spielberg and the Shoah Foundation. His live testimony can be found at the Shoah Foundation or you can contact Change or me. My mom, she was a fire plug. She was interviewed as well by the Shoah Foundation. She wrote her memoirs, My Haunted Memories, and her story can be found on Change's website. She became heavily involved with the New Jersey State Commission for Holocaust Education. New Jersey was one of the first states in the country to mandate legislatively Holocaust education in the schools. And that was 20 something years ago, maybe longer. It is still a work in process, but we are making great progress. Through this commission, she was able to speak to so many school children, teachers and adults, adults, and forged such great relationships. From this also, she became very involved with the Center for Holocaust Studies in Middletown, New Jersey, which eventually became Change, where I have been on the board for the last 22 years, and I currently serve as its board president. couple of post-war anecdotes. I mentioned to you when my mom was in Plashov, she had her appendix taken out by a young Jewish doctor, remember? In May, 1947, as my mother was being rolled into Zion Israel Hospital, which is now my Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn, she was giving birth to my brother, Stephen. The doctor raises my mother's hospital gown and says, I know that stomach. It was the same doctor from Plashov who operated on her and removed her appendix, Dr. Schindler. You do remember now the story that I told you earlier. In the early 60s, my dad started a new job. And, and the point of the antidotes is the circle of life. So in the early 60s, my dad started a new job in New York City. 
My father by trade was a tailor and a pattern maker. And during one of the first few days on his job, he was talking to his boss. And my father mentioned that he was from Tardif, Poland. And his boss said, that's funny. I have a cousin from Tardif who now lives in Paris. His cousin is Franya, my mom's closest and best friend. And if you remember, they were separated after Auschwitz was liberated. And they never knew what happened to each other. As I mentioned, my mom was liberated from Bergen-Belsen in Germany. Franja was liberated from Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. Within a short period of time, they were reunited and stayed very close for all these years. She is the aunt that I never had. I was very fortunate. Her children are the same age as my brother and me. It was like a mirror image. I spent the summer of 1971, I was 16 and a half years old, and I stayed with them in France and the family for nine weeks. I talked to their family all the time still. Franja is still alive, she's 93, and she still talks to the students. Recently, she received the French Medal of Honor, the highest achievement for her bravery. She became the model Holocaust survivor. I also mentioned earlier that mom and Franja went through Auschwitz together and that the numbers were one in succession. So I know it's a little bit of fuzzy picture, but the top arm is the arm of Franja, A22350. The bottom is A, my mother's arm, 22351. My grandfather, as mentioned before, died in the Flossenburg concentration camp on March 3rd, 1945, 45 days before the camp was liberated. And his prisoner number is 82725. We know this information because through the Red Cross tracing program in the 1990s, we were able to obtain a copy of his death certificate. Could you imagine during all this chaos and murder and mayhem, Germans had time to document. So this document was provided by the International Tracing Service. And in there it says that Pinchas Wiener, born in Poland, died on March 3rd and gave us his prisoner number. Brings life to us. It allows us to close the book and allows the family to do yard site for him. Very important to my family. Circle of life. In 2002, we were contacted by a researcher, Margit Brenner from Vienna, concerning my dad and his family. Apparently in March, 1942, the Anthropological Institute at the University of Vienna came into the ghetto in Tarnoff. You know, as you listen to me talk through this, a lot went on in that ghetto. They came into Tarnoff to do a race study. R-A-C-E, a race study project on understanding what makes up the typical European Jew. Question is, when they opened up these files, who were these 105 families? 565 men, women and children in this study that was uncovered when the wall came down and the archives opened up. We have now pictures and collective history of these families, but who are they? Well, they went through the list and my father's family was one of the families. My dad did not remember this at all during all the years as I was growing up. I guess trauma has a way to block out or suppress a lot of our memories. 
of the 105 families, which made up 565 people, there were only survivors for 30 of those families. That meant that over 70%, 75 families had no further trace of family lineage. Unimaginable, nothing, gone, wiped out. Please note that one of the other families that they found, one of the 30 families was Franya's family. They were also part of this race study. So we were notified 2002. 18 years later, Margie Brenner reaches out and brought this race study to life by publishing a book called Final Pictures. And they had an exhibit that opened in Berlin at the Topography of Terror Museum, which is the former SS headquarters. The opening was this past October. Unfortunately, it was virtual, but my father's family was displayed. I had a chance to participate on the, in the exhibit. What Margit did is she brought back to life my parents' family plus countless other families. So I have now studio pictures of my family. And you can see in this picture, these are some of the pictures that were taken in an apartment in the ghetto. On the top left is my grandmother, number 81, my aunt Sarah, 82. 83 is my father in the middle, 84, my uncle Feodor, and my grandfather, 80. If you look at my grandparents, my grandmother was 44 years old. If you look at her, the age, what she was seeing, what she was a part of, you can see how it's aged and just, you could see it in their eyes. Besides the pictures, we have history of my family. So for each picture and each participant, they took all the important information, where they were born, names of the grandparents, their great grandparents. So I have now date of birth of my grandparents, date of birth of my great grandparents, date of death of my great grandparents, so information we never had before. So if you live a normal life where your family are not subject to such conditions, you have a family tree, you know where all this information is. But so now we brought everything to life. This researcher, Margaret Brenner, hopefully will be presenting her study to the center at Change through a breakfast, through a lunch and learn in May. But I want to show you this picture. This picture is, is displayed in our exhibit in change. And if I can read you at the bottom, the Nazi photos taken of Victor Dorman's parents attempting to illustrate the anthropomorphic features of the exterminated race. This is what the Germans wanted to do. And you can see the pictures and you can see the top pictures. The middle one is the picture that I showed you over here, but they've taken pictures of other angles as well. And included in the family background, they did measurements of the facial crane and the crania and everything else, a complete anthropological story. To the right, you could see pictures before the war of my grandparents. In 1997, my mom, my brother, Stephen, and I went back to Poland. My father did not want to go. We went to Tarnow, stayed there for two nights. For my mother, it was closing a book. One day we went to the local park where she used to play as a child and she stopped. She took a deep breath and she started to cry. If you know my mother, she never cried. My mother's memories was the smell of the lilacs 
in the park and in the town. And it reminded her of her home and her childhood. And then I realized all my life growing up, wherever it was, Kansas, Fairlawn, New Jersey, we always had lilacs in the house and lilacs outside. Boy, the small things in life that we, that we learn to appreciate and maybe forget. We went to Krakow, Plashov, took a tour of Plashov, and then we did a long walking tour of Auschwitz-Birkenau together with a guide, a driver slash guide. We were able to film my mom walking through. She took us through everything. Her memory was un unbelievable. At one point, we were in the famous guardhouse that overlooked the railroad tracks coming in. In any of the movies, you would, that would always be the first scene of Auschwitz. And when, we're, when we were in the building, small room, there was a group of Polish children from school in there and the teacher was pointing things out. Well, guess what? Mom turned around, started talking to the kids in Polish, captivated them. Incredible. We then went to Warsaw and then we went to France and we stayed a week with Franja and her family. I think that was the last time that mom, because mom and Franja became a little bit older and fragile. That was the last time they, they did see each other. I mentioned to you that my mom received a blouse when she was liberated and I showed you the picture of her in a blouse. Right now, the blouse is on display at Change. You know, before I showed a glimmer of the picture, but um, I, I don't want to, uh, I'm going to have technical difficulties. I'm going to run into it. So she kept the blouse. It's now on display predominantly at the, at the exhibit and um, things that we hold on to. On this last picture, this is again, my parents' wedding picture. And looking through all the pictures of my mom and dad, just trying to capture their essence of who they were. It's so difficult, isn't it? But this picture was taken at my son Neil's engagement party in, in 2003. So 57 years separate these pictures uh, and to show you the circle of life. And I just thought that was important to me and I wanted to share that with you. My mom so eloquently stated, our grandchildren should know what we went through. Sometimes I get a terrible, terrible anger. How did they take our families, complete families, that there is no one left? There are no memories, like they never existed. The world needs to know and never forget. We leave our legacy to you. I hope you pass it on to your children and them to theirs. Please don't forget, tell the story. And we hope that never in this world, anything like this happens again. Before I end my presentation, I wanna thank you all on behalf of my family and all of those survivors and all of those who perished and were never able to tell their story. Thank you. Be safe and healthy.